Woman in Socialism by August Bebel. Chapter 21. Fundamental Laws of Socialistic Society. 1. Duty to work of all able-bodied persons. As soon as society has become the owner of all means of production, the duty to work of all able-bodied persons, regardless of sex, becomes a fundamental law of socialized society. Society cannot exist without labor. It therefore is justified in demanding that all who seek to satisfy their requirements should also serve to the best of their physical and mental abilities in producing the commodities that are needful to satisfy the requirements of all. The silly assertion that the socialists wish to abolish is an absurdity. Wish to abolish work is an absurdity. Lazy persons, shirkers of work, are met with in bourgeois society only. Socialism is agreed with the Bible in asserting that he who will not work, neither shall he eat. But work shall be useful, productive activity. The new society will therefore insist that everyone choose some definite industrial, agricultural, or other useful activity, whereby he performs a certain amount of labor for the satisfaction of existing requirements. No enjoyment without labor, without labor, no enjoyment. Since all are obliged to work, all have the same interest in having three conditions of labor complied with. Firstly, that the workday shall not be too long and that the work shall not require overexertion. Secondly, that the work shall be varied and as agreeable as possible. Thirdly, that it shall be as productive as possible since on this the length of the workday and the number of obtainable enjoyments depend. But these three conditions again are determined by the number and the nature of the means of production and the workers. They are furthermore determined by the, requ the required standard of living. Socialistic society does not establish itself in order to lead a proletarian existence, but to abolish the proletarian manner of living of the great majority of people. It seeks to grant to everyone the fullest measure of the comforts and joys of life, and so the question arises, to what extent will the requirements of society grow? In order to determine this, an administration will be necessary that comprises all fields of social activity. Here our municipalities will form an appropriate foundation. If they are too large to permit of obtaining an insight, they may be divided into districts. As in primitive society, all members of the communities who are of age, regardless of sex, will participate in the elections and choose the persons who are to take charge of the administration. At the head of all local bodies, there will be a central administration. This, let it be noted, will not be a government with ruling powers, but an executive board of managers. Whether this board of managers is to be elected by the entire population or by the local boards is not essential. These questions will not be as important then as they are now, for election to these offices will not mean greater power and influence and a higher income. They will be positions of trust to which the fittest, be they men or women, will be elected, and they can be recalled or re-elected as conditions may demand or as it may seem desirable to the voters. All offices are temporary. The persons who hold their, these positions, therefore, cannot be regarded as officials. Their function is not a permanent one, nor is a hierarchical order of advancement provided for. Viewed from this standpoint, it also becomes a matter of indifference whether there will be any intermediate bodies between the central administration and the local administrations as provincial administrations, etc. If considered necessary, they will be instituted. If not, they will be omitted. All that will be determined by experience. If progress in the development of society should make old institutions superfluous, they will be abolished without any ado and without any conflict, since no one is personally interested in their maintenance, and new ones will be instituted instead. This thoroughly democratic administration is very different from the present. At the present time, what battles in the newspapers, what a warfare of tongues in the parliaments, what piles of documents in the government offices to accomplish an insig insignificant change in the administration or government. 
To begin with, the main task will be to determine the existing forces. The number and kind of means of production, factories, workshops, means of transportation, area of land, and the previous productivity. Further, it will be necessary to determine the supply on hand and the number of articles and products required to supply the demand in a given length of time. As at present, the state and the various municipalities annually determine their budgets. This will in future be done for the entire social demand, and changes made necessary by new or increased demands can be fully taken into consideration. Statistics here become the main factor. They are the most important auxiliary science in the new society since they furnish the standard whereby all social activity may be measured. Statistics are being used for similar purposes at present on a large scale. The budgets of nation, state, and municipality are founded on a great number of statistical investigations that are annually undertaken by the various branches of administration. Experience of long duration and a cer certain stability in current demands simplify them. Under normal conditions, every manufacturer and every merchant is also enabled to determine his requirements for the coming quarter of a year and in what manner he must arrange his production and his purchases. Unless excessive changes occur, he can meet them readily and without much difficulty. The experience that the crises are brought on by blind anarchistic production, that is to say because goods are produced without any knowledge of the stock on hand, the sales and the demand for the various articles on the world market, has caused the captains of industry in various branches, as already stated, to form trusts. The object of these trusts is to determine prices on the one hand, and on the other to regulate production. By the producing ability of each individual concern and by the sales it is likely to make, the amount of goods to be produced for the coming months is determined. Failure to comply with these rules is punished by a fine and by proscription. The manufacturers form these agreements not to benefit, but to harm the public and solely for their own advantage. Their purpose is to use the power of cooperation to ensure the greatest advantage for themselves. By regulating production, it becomes possible to exact the payment of prices that can never be obtained as long as the individual manufacturers compete with one another. So the manufacturer enriches himself at the expense of the consumer, who must pay the fixed price for the article that he needs. And as the consumer is injured by the trusts, so also the worker. Regulation of production by the manufacturers releases a number of workers and employee, employees, and thus, in order to live, must underbid their fellow workers. Moreover, the social power of the trust is so great that the labor unions too can barely cope with them. The employers accordingly enjoy a double advantage. They receive higher prices and pay lower wages. This regulation of unions, too, can rarely cope oh, wait, this regulation of production by associations of employers is the opposite of that which will take effect in socialistic society. Today, the interest of the employers is the determining factor. In the future, it will be the interest of the general public. But in bourgeois society, even the best organized trust cannot overlook and compute all the factors. Competition and speculation on the world market continue to rage, in spite of the trust, and suddenly it becomes manifest that the calculation is faulty and the artificial structure breaks down. Like industry, commerce also possesses far-reaching statistics. Every week, the large centers of commerce in seaport towns um, publish lists of the supplies on hand of kerosene, cotton, sugar, coffee, wheat, etc. Sometimes these statistics are not exact, because the owners of the goods occasionally have a personal interest in preventing the truth from becoming known. But taken all in all, these statistics are pretty reliable and enable those interested to judge the probable aspect of the market in the near future. But here, too, speculation enters into consideration that frequently deceives and upsets all calculations and often makes it impossible to carry on an honest business. 
Just as a general regulation of production is made impossible in bourgeois society by the conflicting interests of the countless private producers, so the regulation of distribution is made impossible by the speculative nature of commerce and by the conflicting interests of the great number of persons engaged in it. But what has been accomplished so far gives an idea of what can be accomplished as soon as private interests disappear and the common interest predominates. An example of this is, for instance, the harvest statistics compiled annually by various states that make it possible to calculate the crops, the amount needful to supply the domestic demand and the probable prices. But in a socialized society, conditions will be perfectly orderly since the solidarity of society will have been established. Everything is carried out according to plans in an orderly way and so it will be easy to determine the amounts required by the various demands. When some experience has been gained, everything will run smoothly. When the average demand for meat, bread, shoes, garments, etc. has been statistically determined, and when the output of the respective establishments of produ production is known, the average daily amount of socially necessary labor can be established. It further can be determined whether more establishments of production are needed or whether some can be dispensed with as superfluous and can be fitted out for other purposes. Every individual chooses the branch of industry in which he wishes to be employed. The great number of very different realms of activity makes it possible to take the most varied wishes into consideration. If there is an excess of workers in one branch and a lack of workers in another, it will be the duty of the administration to make the necessary arrangements and to bring about an equalization. To organize production and to give opportunity to the various forces to be employed at the right place will be the chief task of the elected administrations. As all perfect themselves in their, as all perfect themselves in their particular tasks, the wheels run more smoothly. The different branches of industry and subdivisions elect their managers who must control the work, but these are no slave drivers, as overseers and foremen are today, but fellow workers who simply practice the administrative function entrusted to them. In place of a productive one, it is not, or in place of a productive one. It is not impossible that at a more advanced stage of organization and with a more perfect education of all its members, these functions will become alternating and will, in definite rotation, be overtaken by all persons concerned, regardless of sex. 2. Harmony of Interests Labor, organized on a basis of complete freedom and democratic equality with one for all and all for one, will call forth a rivalry and a desire to create that are nowhere met with under the present industrial system, and this joy of creation will enhance the productivity of labor. Since all work for one another, they are interested in having all objects well made and with as little waste of time and strength as possible, be it to save labor or to gain time for the manufacture of new products destined to satisfy higher demands. This common interest will cause all to seek to improve, simplify and hasten the process of work. The ambition to discover and invent will be stimulated to the highest degree and people will will endeavor to outdo each other in the new ideas and suggestions. So the opposite of what is claimed by the opponents of socialism will be true. How many discoverers and inventors perish in bourgeois society? How many are exploited and cast aside? If intelligence and talent were to hold the foremost place in bourgeois society instead of property, the greater part of the employers would have to make way for their working men, foremen, mechanics, engineers, chemists, etc. These are the men who, in 99 cases out of 100, have made the discoveries, inventions, and improvements that are applied by the man with the full purse. How many thousands of discoverers and inventors have failed because they could not find a man who would furnish the money to carry out their discoveries and inventions? And how many meritorious discoverers and inventors are crushed by the social misery of daily life is quite beyond our calculation. Not the persons endowed with a quick intelligence and a clear brain are masters of the world, but those endowed with ample means, which does not imply that a, 
that a clear brain and a full purse cannot belong to the same person. Everyone engaged in practical life knows with how much suspicion the working men regard every improvement, every new invention that is introduced today, and their suspicion is entirely justified. For, as a rule, not the workers but the employers are the only ones to derive any advantage from it. The worker must fear that the new machine or the improvement will make him superfluous and turn him out into the street. Instead of joyfully acclaiming a new invention that is a credit to humanity and ought to be a boon to him, he curses it. Many an improvement in the process of production invented by working men has never been introduced. The inventor keeps his invention to himself because he fears that it will harm him instead of benefiting him. Such are the natural results of conflicting interests. In socialistic society, the conflict of interests will be removed. Everyone will develop his abilities to serve himself and will thereby serve society. At present, satisfaction of personal egotism and service of society usually are extremes that exclude each other. <coughs> In the new society, these extremes will not exist. Satisfaction of personal egotism and service of society will be harmonious. They will coincide. The splendid influence of, of such a status of morals is obvious. The productivity of labor will rapidly increase, especially will the productivity of labor grow, because the dissemination of forces among hundreds of thousands of tiny manufacturers with imperfect tools and insufficient means will cease. It has been previously shown among how many small, medium-sized and large manufactories German industry is, is disseminated. By gathering in all the small and medium-sized manufactories into manufacture on a large scale and great establishments that will be furnished with all the most modern technical improvements, a tremendous waste of effort, time, material of all kinds, light, heat, etc., and space will be removed, and the productivity of labor will be heightened. The difference that exists between the productivity of small, medium-sized, and large manufactories may be illustrated by an example from the Industrial Census of Massachusetts of 1890. There, the factories in 10 chief branches of industry are divided into three classes. Those that produced less than $40,000 worth were placed in the lower class. Those that produced between $40,000 and $150,000 worth in the middle class, and those that produced over $150,000 worth in the upper class. Twice the number of small factories compared to the large and medium-sized ones turned out only 9.4% of the entire production, while the large factories, which formed only 23% of the, of the total number, produced almost two and a half times the quantity of all others. But even the large establishments could be organized much more rationally still, so that the total production might yield a still far greater quantity. How much time can be gained by placing production on a rational basis? That has been shown by interesting calculations made by T. H. Hertzka in his book on the law of social evolution, published in 1886. He calculated how much time and labor power would be needful to satisfy the demands of the population of Austria, which was 22 millions strong at the time. For this purpose, Hertzka investigated the productivity of the large establishments in the various lines of industry and based his calculations on the results. This calculation includes the farming of 10.5 million hectares of cultivated soil and 3 million hectares of pasturage, which should suffice to supply said population with meat and the products of agriculture. Furthermore, Hertzka included in his calculation the building of homes in such a manner that every family might have their own house with a space of 150 square meters for a period of 50 years. It was found that for agriculture, building, the production of flour and sugar, coal mining, iron and machine industry, the clothing industry and the chemical industry, 615,000 workers would be needed who would have to work through the year for the present average number of hours daily. 
but the 615,000 workers formed only 12.3% of the able-bodied population of Austria, not counting the women, nor the male inhabitants under 16 or over 50. If the 5 million men available at the time of the calculation were employed, like the 615,000 each of them would have to work only 36.9 days, about six weeks annually, to supply the most needful requirements for 22 million 22 million human beings. But if we assume 300 workdays annually instead of 37, we find that under the new organization it would be necessary to work only one and three-eighths three eighths hour of hours daily to supply the most necessary requirements. Hertzka also takes the requirements of luxury of the better situated classes into consideration and finds that the manufacture of such articles to supply the demands of 22 million people will require 315,000 more workers. According to Hertzka then, about 1 million workers, 20% of the able-bodied male population of Austria, excluding those under 16 and over 50, would be needed to supply the entire needs of the population in 60 days. If we again take the entire able-bodied male population into consideration, we find that they would have to perform only about two and a half hours of work daily. This calculation will not surprise anyone who is well, well acquainted with existing conditions. If we furthermore assume that, with such a short work day, only the sick and the invalids must be excluded, while men over 50 might still work and youths under 16 might be active to some extent, and that the women might also serve in industry, except those who are engaged in child rearing, the preparation of food, etc., we find that the hours of work might be shortened still more, or that the demands might be greatly increased. Nor will anyone deny that tremendous, incalculable progress may still be made in perfecting the process of production, a factor that will create further advantages. On the other hand, many requirements will be satisfied that only a small minority can satisfy today, and with the higher development of civilization, new requirements will arise that will also have to be satisfied. It must be iterated and reiterated, the new society will not elect to lead a proletarian existence. It will demand the existence of a highly civilized people for all its members, from the first to the last. But it shall not only satisfy all the material requirements, shall also grant to all ample opportunity and time for the study of science and art, and for recreation. 3. Organization of Labor In a number of other very essential points, the socialistic cooperative system will differ from the bourgeois individualistic system. The cheap and poor goods that make up a large portion of bourgeois production and necessarily must make up a large portion of it, because the majority of the customers can afford to purchase only cheap goods that wear out quickly, will be eliminated. Only the best will be produced that will last long and will not have to be renewed as often. The fads and follies of fashion that only favor extravagance and bad taste will disappear. Doubtless, our wearing apparel will be better suited to its purpose and more tasty than today. For the fashions of the last century, especially those of the men, have been conspicuous by their bad taste, but new fashions will no longer be introduced every few months. The present follies of fashion are caused, on the one hand, by the competition of women among themselves, and on the other by conceit and ostentation and the desire to display one's wealth. Moreover, a great many persons depend upon these follies of fashion today, and it is to their interest to encourage and stimulate them. Together with the follies of fashion in dress, the madness of fashion in the style of dwellings will disappear. Here, eccentricity is rampant today. Styles that have required centuries to become evolved among various nations, we are no longer satisfied with European styles but turn to those of Japanese, Indians, Chinese, etc., are used up in a few years and set aside. Persons engaged in mechanical arts hardly know what to do with all the designs and models. They have barely adapted themselves to one style, trusting to recover their expenses, 
when a new style appears that necessitates further sacrifices of time and money and of physical and mental forces. In this mad rushing from one fashion to another and from one style to another, the nervousness of our age is vividly reflected. No one would claim that there is any sense of or reason in this rush and haste, or that it might be regarded as a healthful state of society. Socialism will give greater stability to the habits of life. It will make rest and enjoyment possible and will liberate us from the present haste and excitement. Nervousness, the scourge of our age, will disappear. Work will be made as agreeable as possible. To accomplish this, the places where production is carried on will be furnished practically and tastily. Every means will be resorted to that danger may be eliminated, and that evil smells, smoke, etc., and all unpleasant and harmful factors will be done away with. At first, the new society will produce with the means of production taken over from the old society, but these are insufficient. The workshops are scattered and are not properly constructed or furnished, and tools and machinery do not come up to the demands of the greater great number of persons employed in their desire for safety and comfort. To create a great many large, light, airy, well-equipped workshops becomes an imminent necessity. The arts and crafts, genius and skill are immediately given a vast realm of activity. All branches of machine manufacture and the manufacture of tools, the building trades and the trades of interior decoration find ample opportunity for occupation. Whatever the human mind is able to invent in the way of convenient and agreeable buildings, appropriate ventilation, lighting and heating, and technical and mechanical improvements will be instituted. To save motor power, light and heat, as well as time and labor, and to ensure the comfort of the workers, it will become desirable to concentrate the workshops in definite places. The dwellings will be separated from the workshops and freed from the unpleasant unpleasantness of industrial activity, and the unpleasantness will be diminished and finally abolished by all sorts of institutions and appliances. Even the present status of technical knowledge gives us sufficient means to deprive the dangerous occupations, like mining, the chemical trades, etc., of their dangers entirely. But these means are not applied in bourgeois society because they entail a heavy expense and because no one is duty bound to do more for the protection of the working man than is absolutely necessary. The dangers of mining, for instance, could be removed by working the mine in a different manner, by a thorough system of ventilation, by the installation of electric light, by a considerable shortening of the hours of work, and by a frequent change of shifts. It does not require special ingenuity to find safety appliances that will make accidents in the building trade next to impossible and to make this sort of work particularly agreeable. For instance, ample contra contrivances might be made to shield the workers at large buildings and at all out, out of door work from the sun and the rain. In socialistic society, which will control an abundance of labor power, it will also be simple matter to have fr frequent relays of new workers and to concentrate certain tasks upon definite seasons or definite hours of the day. The problem of abolishing dust, smoke, grime, and unpleasant odors can also be solved entirely even today by chemistry and mechanics, but it is not done or insufficiently done because the private employers do not care to meet the heavy expense. The future places of production, wherever they may be, below the earth or above, will differ most favorably from the present ones. In private industry, improved appliances are mainly a question of money. If they pay, they will be established. If they do not pay, the health and life of the working men are of no concern. In socialistic society, the question of profits will have ceased to exist. This society will recognize no other consideration but the welfare of its members. What is to their advantage must be established. What is likely to harm them must be refrained from. No one will be compelled to enter into dangerous undertakings. 
If tasks are undertaken that entail dangers, one may be assured that there will be many volunteers, all the more so because the undertakings will not serve destruction but the advancement of civilization. Four, the growth of the productivity of labor. A far-reaching appliance of motor power and of the most perfect machines and tools, a detailed division of labor and a skillful combination of the various forces will so heighten the productivity of labor that the, nece the necessary quantities of all the commodities can be produced, notwithstanding a considerable shortening of the hours of work. Increased production will be to the, to the common advantage of all. The share of each individual increases with the productivity of labor, and the increased productivity of labor, again, makes it possible to reduce the time required for the performance of socially necessary labor. Among the motor powers that will be applied, electricity will most likely hold the foremost place. Bourgeois society everywhere presses it into service, and the more this is done, the better it is for general progress. The revolutionizing effects of the most powerful of all natural forces will only hasten the overthrow of the bourgeois world and help to usher in socialism. But only in socialistic society will the force be generally applied and turned to the best advantage. Both as a motor power and as a source of light and heat, it will contribute largely to the improvement, improved standard of living of society. Electricity Electricity is distinguished from every other force by the fact that it exists in nature in abundance. Our streams, high and low tide of the sea, wind and sunlight will furnish countless horsepowers when we shall thoroughly understand how to apply them. A wealth of energy that by far exceeds all demands is furnished by those parts of the surface of the earth that are so regularly subjected to the heat of the sun that it might be applied to regular technical operations. Perhaps it would not be an exaggerated precaution if a nation would even now secure a share in such places. The required areas need not even be very large. A few square miles in Northern Africa would suffice for the requirements of a country like the German Empire. By concentrating the heat of the sun, a high temperature can be produced, and thereby everything else. Portable mechanical work, charging of batteries, light and heat, and by electrolysis, even fuel. The man who opens up these vistas is not a dreamer, but an appointed professor at the Berlin University and president of the Royal Physical and Technical Institute, a man who ranks high in the scientific world. At the 79th Congress of the British Association in Winnipeg during August 1909, the famous English physicist Sir S. Thompson said, The day is not too far distant when our life will be revolutionized by applying the rays of the sun. Man will liberate himself from his dependence upon coal and water power, and all large cities will be surrounded by immense apparatus, real sunbeam, tra real sunbeam traps, into which the heat of the sun will be gathered and the obtained energy will be stored away in tremendous reservoirs. It is the force of the sun stored away in coal, in waterfalls, in nourishment that performs all the world's work. How great is this tribute of force that the sun pours down upon us becomes evident when we consider the fact that the warmth received by the earth when the sun is high and the sky is clear, according to the researches of Langley, equals an energy of 7,000 horsepowers per acre. Although our engineers have not yet found the way to apply this gigantic source of power, I do not doubt that they will ultimately succeed in finding it. When the supply of coal in the bowels of the earth has been exhausted, when the water powers will no longer suffice to meet our requirements, when we will obtain from this source all the energy needed to complete the work of the world, then the centers of industry will be removed to the glowing deserts of Sahara, and the value of the land will be measured by how well it is suited to the erection of the great sunbeam tra traps. According to this, our anxiety that we might at some time lack fuel is removed. The inventions of the accumulators will make it possible to store a large quantity of force away for future use at any time and place. 
so that besides the power furnished by sun and tide, the power furnished by the wind and by mountain torrents, which can be obtained only periodically, may be stored and applied. So there may finally be no human task for which motor power cannot be supplied if necessary. Only by the assistance of electricity has it become possible to employ water power on a larger scale. According to T. Cohn, eight European states have the... F um, there's a table I'm not going to read. Of the German states, Baden and Bavaria control the largest amount of water power. Baden alone can obtain 200,000 horsepower at the Upper Rhine. Bavaria has at its disposal 300,000 horsepower that have so far not been applied, besides 100,000 that are applied. Professor Rebach estimates that the theoretical energy of the entire amount of water flowing upon the surface of the Earth amounts to 8,000 million horsepower. If only the 16th part of this could be efficiently applied, 500 millions of permanently serviceable, permanently, permanently serviceable horsepower could still be won. An amount of energy 10 times as great as the energy obtained by the, by the mining of coal during the year 1907, approximately calculated at 1,000 million tons. Although such calculations are, are of a purely theoretical character at present, they still show what achievements we may anticipate in the future from the use of white coal. That the Niagara Falls alone, which flow from lakes covering an area of 231,880 kilometers, about 34% of the entire area of Germany, might furnish more water power than exists in England, Germany, and Switzerland combined. According to another calculation quoted in an official report, the United States have water power at their disposal of no less than 20 million horsepower, which represent an equivalent of 300 million tons of coal annually. The mills that will be driven by means of this white or green coal with the force of the gushing mountain streams and waterfalls will have no smokestacks and no fire. Electricity will also make it possible to more than double the speed of our railroads. At the, be at the beginning of the 90s of the last century, Mr. Meems in Baltimore declared it to be possible to construct an electric car that would make 300 kilometers an hour. And Professor Elio Thompson in Lynn believed that electric motors could be constructed that would make it possible to cover 260 kilometers an hour. These expectations have nearly been realized. The trial rides made on the military railway Berlin to Zossen, or Berlin Zossen, hmm, during 1901 and 1902 showed the possibility of speed up to 150 kilometers an hour. During experiments made in 1903, the Siemens car attained a speed of 201 kilometers and that of the General Electric Company 208 kilometers. In the succeeding years, steam locomotives have also attained a speed of 150 kilometers an hour and more. The present aim is to attain 200 kilometers per hour. Already, August Scherl has entered the arena with his new project of rapid transit, which relegates the existing railway lines to freight service and proposes to connect the large cities by monorail train service with a speed of 200, 200 kilometers. The question of transforming railroad service from steam into electricity is a current topic in England, Australia, Aus Austria, <laughs> Italy, and America. Between New York and Philadelphia, an electric train is to run at a speed of 200 kilometers an hour. The speed of ocean vessels will increase in the same manner. Here, the determining factor is the, stream, the steam turbine. It holds the foremost place in technical interest at present. It seems destined to displace the piston. While most engineers still regarded the steam turbine as a task of the future, it had become a present-day problem that attracted the attention of the entire world of technics by its success. It remained for elect electrotechnics, with its rapidly running machinery to create a large field for the practical application of this new power engine. 
The by far greatest number of all steam turbines in use today serves to drive dynamos. The turbine has especially proved its superiority over the piston in navigation. The English steamship Lusitania, which is equipped with steam turbines during August 1909, made the journey from Ireland to New York in four days, 11 hours and 42 minutes, with an average speed of 25.85 knots an hour. The steamship America, constructed in 1863, the fastest vessel at the time, made 12.5 knots an hour. The day is not distant when the problem of electric propellers for large vessels will be satisfactorily solved. They are already in use with smaller vessels. Simplicity, safety, good self-regulation and absence of shaking make the steam turbine the ideal power for the creation of electric energy on board. <clears throat> Electricity will eventually be generally applied to both railway, railway and steamship service. By electricity, the techniques of moving loads has also been revolutionized. Steam power having made it possible to construct lifting engines with natural force, electric transmission of power led to a complete revolution in the construction of lifting machines by giving these machines freedom of motion and constant readiness for use. Electric power has, among other things, led to a complete transformation in the construction of the cranes. With its massive curved beak of rolled iron resting upon a heavy foundation of stone masonry, with slow motions and the hissing noise of the puffed out steam, the steam crane conveys the impression of resembling a gigantic prehistoric monster. When it is grasped a load, it exhibits a tremendous power for lifting, but it needs the assistance of human beings who, by means of chains, fasten the weights to its hook. Owing to its clumsiness and slow motions, it is serviceable only for the lifting of very heavy loads, but not where quick action is needed. Even externally, the modern electric crane presents an entirely different aspect. We behold graceful steel trellis work stretched above the hall, and from this is stretched out a slender pair of tongs, which is movable in all directions. The whole mechanism is controlled by a single man. By means of a gentle pressure on the levers, he directs the electric currents and drives the slender steel limbs of the crane to rapid action. Unaided, they grasp the glowing steel and whirl it through the air, while no other noise is heard but the low buzzing of the electromotors. Without the aid of these machines, the steadily increasing transportation of masses of goods would not be possible. By a comparison of the wharf crane at Pola and that of, at Kiel, the development in regard to the increase of lifting power from the middle to the end of the 19th century may be judged. The lifting power of the former was 60 tons, that of the latter 200 tons. The manufacture of Bessemer steel only is possible when rapidly working lifting machines are at hand. For otherwise, the tremendous quantities of liquid steel that are produced in a short time could not be transported in the casting molds. In the iron works of Krupp and Essen alone, 608 cranes are in action, having an aggregate lifting power of 6,513 tons, equal to a freight train of 650 cars. The low cost of freight, which is a condition of present-day international commerce, would not be possible. Could not the capital invested in vessels be put to such intense use by the rapid process of unloading? The equipping of a vessel with electric cranes led to a reduction in the annual cost of traffic from 23,000 to 13,000 marks, almost by one half. And this comparison takes into consideration only the progress of a single decade. The techniques of navigation and transportation present new achievements almost daily along all fines. The problem of aerial navigation, which seemed insoluble but two decades ago, is practically solved. At present, the dirigible balloons and flying machines do not serve the easier and cheaper transportation of the masses, but only sport and military purposes. But later on, they will enhance the productive forces of society. Great progress has also been made by wireless telegraphy, 
its industrial value grows each day. In a few years, accordingly, traffic will be placed on a new basis. Mining, too, is in, is in a state of transformation, at present, that still seemed inconceivable 10 years ago. Electricity has been introduced and has revolutionized the machines, the pumps, and the winding engines. Marvelous are the prospects revealed by the former French Minister of Public Instruction, Professor Bertolot, who died March 18, 1907, in an address on the future significance of chemistry delivered at a banquet of the Syndicate of Manufacturers of Chemicals. In this address, Mr. Bertolot depicted the possible achievements of chemistry in the year 2000. And though his description contains some humorous exaggerations, it also contains much that is true, of which the following is a brief synopsis. Mr. Bertolot gave a resume of what chemistry had accompanied or accomplished in a few decades and enumerated, among other things, the manufacture of sulfuric acid, of soda, bleaching and dyeing, beet sugar, therapeutic alkaloids, gas, gilding and silvering, etc. Then came electrochemistry, which completely transformed metallurgy, the chemistry of explosives, which provided mining and warfare with new engines, and the marvels of organic chemistry in the manufacture of colors, perfumes, therapeutic and antiseptic remedies, etc. But all this, said the lecturer, was only a beginning. Far greater problems would soon be solved. In the year 2000, agriculture and peasants would have ceased to exist, as chemistry would have made cultivation of the soil superfluous. There would be no coal mines and accordingly no miner strikes. Fuel would be replaced by chemical and physical processes. Tariff and warfare would be abolished. Aerial navigation, employing chemicals as a means of locomotion, would have done away with these an antiquated institutions. The problem of industry consists in finding sources of power that are inexhaustible and can be renewed with the least possible amount of labor. Until now, we have generated steam by the chemical energy of burned coal, but the coal is difficult to obtain and the supply is diminishing daily. It becomes necessary to utilize the heat of the sun and the heat inside the earth. There is good reason to hope that both these sources will find unlimited application, thereby the source of all heat and, all, and of all industry would be made accessible. If water power were also applied, <clears throat> all imaginable machines might be run on the earth. This source of power would barely diminish in centuries. By means of the warmth of the earth, many chemical problems might be solved, among others the chemical production of food. Theoretically, this problem is already solved. The synthesis of fats and oils is long since known. Sugar and the hydrates of carbon are also are known also. And the synthesis of the nitrogen compounds will soon become known. The problem of food is a purely chemical one. As soon as the necessary cheap power could be obtained by means of carbon from carbon carbonic acid, oxygen and hydrogen from water, and nitrogen from the atmosphere, food of all kinds would be produced. What had heretofore been done by the plants would henceforth be done by industry, and the products of industry would be more perfect than those of nature. The time would come when everyone would carry a box of chemicals in his pocket, from which he would satisfy his need of nourishment and albumin, fat and hydrates of carbon, regardless of time and seasons of rain and drought a frost, hail, and destructive insects. <clears throat> this would lead to a transformation that was as yet beyond our conception. Orchards, vineyards, and pastures would disappear. Man would become more gentle and humane because he would no longer live upon the murder and destruction of living beings. Then the difference between fertile and unfertile regions would also disappear, and perhaps the deserts would become the favorite resorts of man since they are healthier than the damp and marshy plains where agriculture is carried on at present. Then art and all the beauties of human life would attain their fullest development. The earth would no longer be disfigured by the geometrical figures drawn on its surface by agriculture, but would become a garden in which grass, flowers, shrubs, and forests might be grown at will. All humanity would dwell in plenty, in a golden age, 
but man would not fall a victim to laziness and corruption. Work is needful to happiness, and man would work as ever, since he worked for his own welfare, for the development of his mental, moral, and aesthetic possibilities. The reader may accept as true from this address of Berthelot whatever he chooses. The fact remains that future development will lead to a tremendous improvement in the quantity, quality, and variety of products, and that the comforts of life of coming generations will increase to a degree that we can barely conceive today. Professor Eliu Thompson agrees with Werner Siemson, Siemens, who declared at the Convention of Scientists in Berlin in 1887 that it would become possible by means of electricity to transform the elements directly into food. Werner Siemens held the opinion that it might be possible at a remote time to produce artificially a hydrate of carbon, as, sugar, uh, as grape sugar or starch, whereby the possibility would be given to make bread of stones. The chemist Dr. H. Meyer declared that it would be possible to make ligneous fiber a source of human nourishment. In the meantime, in 1890, Emil Fischer has actually produced grape sugar artificially and has thereby made a discovery that Werner Siemens considered possible only at a remote time. Since then, chemistry has made still further progress. Indigo, vanilla, and camphor have been artificially produced. In 1906, W. Loeb succeeded in achieving the assimilation of carbonic acid outside of the plant of the, uh, up to the production of sugar by means of electric tension. In 1907, Emil Fischer obtained one of the most complicated synthetic bodies that is closely related to natural protein. In 1908, Will Statter and Benz produced pure chlorophyll and proved it to be a compound of magnesium, thereby the main problem of organic chemistry to obtain albumin may find its solution in a future not too far distant. 5. The remo a removal of the contrast between mental and manual work. A need deeply rooted in human nature is the desire for freedom of choice and for the opportunity of a variation of occupations. Just as the best food becomes disgusting if the same thing is constantly placed before us, so an occupation repeated daily in treadmill fashion weakens and dulls. Man performs his task mechanically and does what he must do, but without enthusiasm or joy. A number of talents and abilities are innate in every human. Being that need but to be awakened being that need but to be awakened in order to find expression and produce favorable results. Only thereby man becomes a perfect human being. Socialistic society will offer ample opportunity for the satisfaction of this desire for variation. The immense increase in productive forces combined with a simplified process of work will not only make it possible to limit the hours of work considerably, it will also make it easy to master a number of varied accomplishments. The old system of apprenticeship has already been abandoned. It still exists and is possible only among undeveloped and antiquated forms of production as represented by small manufacturers. But as these will completely disappear in the new society, all forms and institutions peculiar to them will disappear also. New ones will take their place. Even at present, it can be seen in any factory how few working men have learned and practice a definite trade. The working men employed in some line of production or other may have learned the most varied trades. Usually a short time is sufficient for them to gain experience in one detail of the process of production, and to this one detail they are tied down, then according to the prevailing system of exploitation for long hours, without the slightest variation and without any regard for their personal tastes and inclinations. At the machine they become machines. The state of state of affairs too will be removed by the new social order there will be ample time to practice manual skill and to develop the mechanical arts 
Large, splendidly equipped polytechnical schools will make it easy for both young and old to learn an occupation. Chemical and physical labo laboratories, in keeping with the standards of these sciences, will be erected, and capable teachers will be on hand. Only then will people fully recognize that a wealth of talent and ability has been suppressed or wrongly developed by the capitalistic system of production. Not only will it be possible to satisfy the desire for variation, it must be regarded as the purpose of society to satisfy this desire, since the harmonious development of man depends on it. The professional types that we meet with in present day society, be these types the product of a definite one-sided occupation or of laziness, will gradually disappear. There are exceedingly few persons today who possess the possibility of a of a variety of occupations. Rarely one finds persons so favored by special circumstances that they can escape the monotony of their daily task and can, after the performance of physical work, recuperate by mental work. On the other hand, we sometimes find mental workers who devote part of their time to some manual work, gardening and the like. The beneficial effects of an occupation founded on a variation of mental and physical work are obvious. Such occupation is the only one adapted to natural needs. It is taken for granted, of course, that every occupation must be practiced with moderation and according to individual strength. In his book on the significance of science and art, Count Leo Tolstoy condemns the hypercritical and unnatural character that art and science have assumed as a result of our unnatural social conditions. He roundly condemns the fact that present day society holds physical labor in contempt and advises a return to natural conditions. He asserts that every human being who wishes to live naturally and to enjoy life should spend his day firstly at physical work in agriculture, secondly at some manual trade, thirdly at some mental occupation, and fourthly in intellectual social intercourse. No human being should perform more than eight hours of physical work. Tolstoy himself lived up to this ideal and claimed that he has only become truly human since he adopted this mode of life. But Tolstoy overlooks that what is possible for him, the man of independent means, is not possible for the vast majority of people under present day conditions. A man or woman who must work 10 or 12 hours daily and sometimes longer to make a bare living and who has grown tip in ignorance cannot adopt Tolstoy's mode of life. Neither can all those adopt it who are in the midst of the struggle for existence and must conform with its requirements. And of the few who might live in this manner, many would not wish to. It is one of the illusions in which Tolstoy indulges to believe that exhortations and examples might transform societies. The experience made by Tolstoy in regard to his model of life proves it to be a rational one, but to make this mode of life general, different social conditions, a new society will be needed. The coming society will establish such conditions. It will produce countless scientists and artists, but all of these will devote a part of the day to physical labor, and the remainder of the day they will devote to their studies, their arts, and to social intercourse, according to their tastes and wishes. The present contrast between mental and manual work, a contrast that is intensified by the ruling classes, who are anxious to secure their mental superiority also, will accordingly have to be removed. 6. Increase of Consumption The above enumerated facts prove that panics, crises, and unemployment will be impossible in future society. Crises arise because capitalistic production incited by the desire for profit and without any reliable means of estimating the true demand, leads to overproduction and to overstocking of the market. Under capitalism, the products assume the character of goods that their owners endeavor to exchange, and the consumption of goods depends upon the consumer's purchasing ability. But this purchasing ability is very limited among a, among a vast majority of the population who are not paid the full value of their labor, and whose services are not wanted if their employers cannot squeeze profits out of them. Purchasing ability and the ability to consume are two entirely different matters in bourgeois society. Many millions are in need of new clothes, shoes, furniture, linens, and articles of food, 
but they have no money, and so their needs, their ability to consume, remains unsatisfied. The market is overstocked, but the masses are hungry. They wish to work, but cannot find anyone willing to purchase their labor power because the employers can derive no profits from employing them. Perish, become a vagabond, a criminal. I, the capitalist, cannot help it because I cannot use goods that I cannot sell at a profit. In his position, the capitalist is entirely justified in taking this attitude. In the new society, this contradiction will be removed. The new society will not produce goods to be bought and sold. It will produce commodities for consumption, not for any other purpose. The ability to consume will not be limited by the purchasing ability of each individual, but by the common ability to produce. If there is sufficient labor power and sufficient means of production, every want can be satisfied. The social ability to consume knows no bounds except the satisfaction of the consumers. If there will be no goods in the new society, there will ultimately be no money either. Money appears to be the counterpart of goods, but is goods itself. Yet, at the same time, money is the social equivalent, the standard of value for all other goods. But the new society will not produce goods, it will produce commodities whose manufacture will, will require a certain measure of social working time. The average time required to produce a given commodity is the only standard by which it will be measured for social consumption. 10 minutes of social working time at one commodity equal 10 minutes of social working time at another commodity. No more and no less. Society will not wish to earn, it will merely wish to bring about the exchange of commodities of the same quality and of the same value among its members, and eventually it will not even be necessary to determine the value. Society will simply produce what it needs. If it should become evident, for instance, that three hours of work daily are necessary to produce all the required products, three hours will be the fixed time. If the means of production should be improved to such extent that the supply can be furnished by two hours of work, it will be two hours. If on the other hand, the demands should grow and the increased productivity of the process of work would not suffice to satisfy these demands, the working time would be lengthened. It can easily be calculated how much social labor will be necessary for the manufacture of each product. Thereby the relation of this portion of work to the entire working time can be calculated. Any kind of certificate, a printed piece of paper, gold or tin, enables the holder to exchange same for various kinds of commodities. If he finds that his wants are less than what he receives for his services, he can work less accordingly. If he wishes to give away what he does not use, nobody will prevent him from so doing. If he voluntarily chooses to work for another so that the other one may idle, or if Lai wishes to divide his, or if he wishes to divide his share of the social products, no one will restrain him, but no one can compel him to work for another person's advantage. No one can deprive him of a part of the share he is entitled to for his services. Everyone will be able to satisfy all desires and requirements possible of fulfillment, but not at the expense of others. He receives from society the equivalent of what he produces, no more and no less, and remains free from exploitation. 7. Equal duty to work for all. But how will you discriminate between thrifty and lazy, intelligent and stupid persons? That is one of the questions most frequently asked by our opponents, and the answer we give them puzzles them greatly. But these wise questioners never stop to think that, among our hierarchy of officials, the distinction between thrifty and lazy, intelligent and stupid persons is not made, but that the length of service usually determines the salary and promotion. Teachers and professors, many of whom are the most naive questioners, have their salaries determined by the position they fill, not by the value of their services. In many cases, officials, military men, and scientists are not promoted according to their abilities, but according to rank, relationship, friendship, and the favor of women. That wealth is not measured either by intelligence and thrift may be seen by the three-class electoral system of Prussia. We find saloon keepers, bakers, and butchers, many of whom are not able to speak grammatically enrolled in the first class, while men of intelligence and science 
He highest officials of the state and the nation are enrolled in the second or third class. There will be no difference between thrifty and lazy, intelligent and stupid persons, because that which we understand by these terms will have disappeared. Society, for instance, calls some people lazy because they have been thrown out of employment, have been driven to a life of vagabondage, and have finally become real vagabonds. We also apply this term to people who are the victims of a bad education. But whoever should venture to call lazy the man of means who spends his time in idleness and debauchery would commit an insult, for the rich idler is a respectable man. Now, what aspect will matter, will, matters, what? Now what aspect will matter assume in the new society? What the fuck? Now what aspect will matters assume in the new society? The sentence does make sense. All will develop tender similar conditions of life. And everyone will perform the task assigned to him by ability and inclination. Therefore, the differences in achievements will be slight. The social atmosphere that will incite each to excel the others will help to level the distinctions. If a person should realize that he is unable to accomplish in one line of work what others accomplish, he will choose some other line better suited to his strength and his abilities. Everyone who has worked together with a great many persons knows that people who are inefficient at one task have proved very efficient when given another. But what right can anyone ask for privileges? If some person is so incapacitated by nature that it is quite impossible for him to accomplish what others accomplish, society cannot punish him for the shortcomings of nature. On the other hand, if someone has been endowed by nature with abilities that elevate him above the others, society not, need not reward him for that which is not his personal merit. It must furthermore be remembered that in socialistic society all will have the same opportunities for education, so that all can develop their knowledge and ability in accordance with their talents and inclinations. As a result, knowledge and abil ability will be far more developed than in bourgeois society. It will be more evenly distributed and yet more varied. When Goethe during a journey along the Rhine, study the Cathedral of Cologne, he discovered by perusal of the architectural deeds that the architects of old had paid all their workingmen alike by time. They did so because they desired good workmanship conscientiously carried out. Carried out. To bourgeois society, this seems an anomaly. Bourgeois society has introduced the piecework system, by means of which the workingmen compel, or another another to overwork and make it all the easier for the employer to underpay and to resort to a frequent reduction in wages. What is true of material productivity is equally true of the mental. Man is the product of time and circumstances. If Goethe had been born in the fourth instead of the in the 18th century, under equally favorable circumstances, instead of becoming a great poet and scientist, he would probably have become a great father of the church who might have outshone St. Augustine. Again, if Goethe had not come into the world as the son of a rich patrician of Frankfurt, but as the son of a poor shoemaker, he would hardly have become minister to the Grand Duke of Weimar, but would have lived and died a respectable master shoemaker. Goethe himself recognized of what great advantage it was to him to have been born in a materially and socially favorable position which helped him to attain his development. He thus expresses himself in Wilhelm Meister. If Napoleon had been born ten years later, he would never have become Emperor of France. Without the War of 1870 to 1871, Gambetta would not have become what he has been. If a gifted child of intelligent parents should be placed among savages, it would become a savage. Men are what society has made them. Ideas are not the product of higher inspiration sprung from the brains of a single individual, but they are a product created in the brains of the individual by the social life and activity amidst which he lives and by the spirit of his age. Aristotle could not have the ideas of Darwin, and Darwin had to reason differently from Aristotle. We all reason as the spirit of our age, that is, our environment and its phenomena, compels us to reason. 
that explains what has been frequently observed, that different people sometimes follow the same line of reasoning simultaneously, that the same inventions and discoveries are made at the same time at places situated far apart, that also explains that an idea expressed 50 years ago may have found the world indifferent, but the same idea expressed 50 years later may agitate the whole world. In 1415, Emperor Sigismund could dare to break the promise given Huss and to have him burned at the stake in Constance. In 1521, Charles V, although a far greater fanatic, had to permit Luther to go in peace from the Diet, uh, from the Diet at Worms. Ideas are the product of social cooperation, of social life. What is true in regard to society in general is especially true in regard to the various social classes that compose society at any given, given epoch of history, because every class has its peculiar interests. It also has its peculiar ideas and views. These conflicting ideas and interests have led to the class struggles that filled the annals of history and have attained their culmination in the class extremes and class struggles of the present day. The feelings, thoughts, and actions of a person are therefore determined not only by the age in which he lives, but also by the class to which he belongs. Without modern society, no modern ideas could exist. This is clear to everyone. In the new society, let it be remembered, the means that each individual will employ for his education and development will be the property of society. Society cannot feel obliged to reward particularly what it alone has made possible, its own product. So much in regard to the qualification of physical and mental labor. From this, the further conclusion may be drawn that no distinction will be made between higher and lower grades of work, as, for instance, at present mechanics consider themselves superior today, laborers who perform work on the roads, etc. Society will, only, society will have only such work performed as is socially useful, and so every kind of work will be of equal social value. Should it not be possible to perform some kinds of dirt, dirty and disagreeable work by means of mechanical or chemical devices, which will undoubtedly be the case to judge by the present rate of progress, and should there be no volunteers, it will be the duty of each worker to perform his share of such work when his turn comes. No false pride and no irrational disdain of useful labor will be recognized. These exist only in our state of drones, where idleness is considered enviable, and where those workers are the most despised, whose tasks are the hardest and most unpleasant ones, and often the most needful to society. Today, the most disagreeable tasks are the ones most poorly paid. The reason for this is that we have a great many workers who have been maintained at a low level of civilization, whom the constant revolution in the process of production has cast out into the street as a reserve force, and who, in order to live, must perform the lowest kinds of work, at wages that even make the introduction of machinery for such work unprofitable. The crushing of stone, for instance, is notoriously one of the most disagreeable and most poorly paid employments. It would be a simple matter to have this crushing of stones done by machinery, as is generally being done in the United States. But in Germany, there is such an abundance of cheap labor that the introduction of the stone crusher would not pay. Street cleaning, the cleaning of sewers, collecting ashes and garbage, garbage, work in shafts in saison, saison, caissons, etc., might even at the present time, with the aid of proper machinery, be performed in such a manner that most of the unpleasantness connected with them for the laborers would disappear. But as a matter of fact, a working man who cleans sewers to guard human beings against the dangers of germs of disease is a very useful member of society. Will a professor who teaches falsified history in the interest of the ruling classes, or a theologian who seeks to mystify the minds of, by the teaching of supernatural doctrines, are very harmful individuals. A great many of our present day scientists and scholars represent a guild that is employed and paid to defend and vindicate the dominance of the ruling classes. By means of the authority of science to let this dominance appear just and necessary and to maintain existing prejudices. In truth, this guild to a great extent poisons the minds and performs work hostile to the advancement of civilization and the interest of the bourgeoisie and its clients. 
a social condition that will henceforth make the existence of such elements of social impo society impossible will perform a liberating deed. On the other hand, true science is often connected with very disagreeable and revolting work. For instance, when a physician dissects a corpse in a state of decomposition or operates upon a per purulent part of the body, or when a chemist examines feces, these tasks are often more revolting than the most disagreeable work performed, performed by unskilled laborers. Yet no one will admit that this is so. The difference is that the performance of the one work requires profound study, while the other work can be performed by anyone without previous preparation. This accounts for the great difference in their estimation. But in future society, where by means of equal opportunities of education for all, the distinctions of educated and uneducated will disappear. The distinction between skilled and unskilled labor will disappear also. This is all the more so because the possibilities of technical development are unlimited, and much that is manual work today will be performed by machines and mechanical processes. We need but consider the present development of our mechanical arts, for instance, engraving, woodcutting, etc., as the most disagreeable tests often are the most useful ones. So our conceptions in regard to pleasant and unpleasant work, like many other conceptions in the bourgeois world, are superficial and founded entirely on outward appearances. Eight, abolition of trade, transformation of traffic. As soon as the new society will have placed production on the basis sketched above, it will, as we have already noted, noted, cease to produce goods and will only produce commodities to supply the social demand. As a result of this, trade will also cease to exist, as trade is needful and possible only in an organization of society founded on the production of goods. By the abolition of trade, a great army of persons of both sexes will be mobilized for productive activity. This great army becomes one of producers. It brings forth commodities and enables society to increase its demands or makes possible a still further reduction of the hours of work. Today, these persons live more or less like parasites on the products of the toil of others. Still, they often work very hard and are burdened with cares without earning enough to supply their wants. In the new society, commercial men, agents, jobbers, etc. will be superfluous. In place of the dozens, hundreds, and thousands of stores of all kinds that we find in every municipality today, according to its size, there will be large municipal storehouses, elegant bazaars, entire exhibitions that will require a comparatively small number of persons for their administration. The entire bustle of trade will be transformed into a centralized, purely administrative activity. The discharge of its duties will be simple and will become still more simplified by the centralization of all social institutions. Traffic will experience a similar transformation. Telegraph and telephone lines, railroads, mail service, river and ocean vessels, streetcars, automobile cars and trucks, airships and flying machines, and whatever all the institutions and vehicles serving traffic and communication may be called, will have become social property. In Germany, many of these institutions, like the mail, the telegraph, the telephone system, and most railroads, have already been made state institutions. Their transformation into public property is a mere matter of form. Here, private interests can no longer be injured. If the state con continues to operate in the present direction, so much the better. But these state-owned institutions are not socialistic institutions, as is erroneously assumed. These institutions are exploited by the state according to the same capitalistic principles as if they were privately owned. Neither the officials nor the working men are particular, but particularly benefited by them. The state does not treat them differently from a private employer. When, for instance, in the bureaus of the National Navy and the Railroad Administration orders are issued not to employ working men who are over 40 years of age, that is a measured measure which proves the class character of the state as a state of exploiters and is bound to rouse the indignation of the workers. Such and similar measures resorted to by the state in its capacity of employer are much worse than when resorted to by private employers. 
The latter is always a small employer compared to the state, and the employment that he refuses may be granted by another. But the state, monopolizing certain branches of employment, may, by such maxims, with one blow, drive thousands into poverty. These are not socialistic but capitalistic actions, and socialists have every reason to protest against the assumption that the present state-owned institutions are socialistic in character and may be, regard be regarded as a realization of socialistic aims. As large, centralized institutions will replace the millions of private dealers and agents of all kinds, so the entire system of transportation will also assume a different aspect. The millions of small shipments that are sent out daily to an equal number of owners and entail a great waste of work, time, and material will be absorbed by shipments on a large scale sent out to the municipal storehouses and the large centers of manufacture. Here too, work will become greatly simplified as it is much simpler to ship raw material to a factory employing 1,000 working men than to ship it to hundreds of scattered small factories. So the centers of production and distribution for entire municipalities or for parts of same will mean a considerable saving. This will be to the advantage of society, but also to the advantage of each individual for public interest and personal interest will then be identical. The aspect of our places of production, of our means of transportation, and especially also of our residences will thereby become entirely changed. They will obtain a much more cheerful aspect. We will be freed to a great extent from the nerve wracking noise, speed and confusion of our large cities with their thousands of vehicles of all kinds. The building of streets, street cleaning, the manner of living, the intercourse of people with one another, all will experience a great transformation. It will then be possible to carry out hygienic measures easily, which today can be carried out only at a great expense and insufficiently, and often only in the residential quarters of the wealthy classes. Under such conditions, traffic and transformation must attain their highest development. Perhaps aerial navigation will be the favorite means of transportation then. The means of transportation are the veins that conduct the exchange of products, the circulation, through the entire body social, and are therefore particularly adapted to the dissemination of an equal standard of comfort and culture. To provide for the extension and ramification of the most perfect means of transportation to the remotest portions of the provinces will become a necessity to the, to the public welfare. Here the new society will set tasks for itself that by far exceed those of present day society. This highly perfected system of communication will also decentralize the masses of humanity that at present congest our large cities and centers of industry and will scatter them broadcast over the land. This will not only be of the greatest benefit to public health, it will also have a decisive influence on the material and intellectual progress of civilization.